Mike Charles for HumbleMechanic.com. Today we're going to be talking about using our brain to diagnose car problems. So this is episode 62 of the Humble Mechanic podcast. Today we're going to be talking a little bit about the diagnostic process, ways to think about how to diagnose cars, the ways you can get stuck, and then how to unstick that stuck. So as a technician, we all develop this diagnostic process. Now mine might be very different from yours, which might be very different from the guy that works next to me. But the end goal is always the same. Fix the car right the first time and do it as fast as possible. And in my opinion, they should all really start the same. And that's the most basic stuff. Duplicate the concern. Evaluate the entire situation of the car. Throughout this episode, I'm gonna be using the example of a lighting circuit because it's so easy to understand. And it used to be such a simple circuit, which now is a lot more complex than that, but it's one that everybody can really understand. There's an old acronym, K-I-S-S, -S, and that was keep it simple, stupid. I think uh, a lot of places have kind of moved away from that because someone might get sad about being called stupid, but that's neither here nor there because it really does apply to fixing cars. With vehicle systems that are so complex, how do we even keep it simple? You have modules controlling everything in the entire vehicle, which is actually a good thing because it gives us a lot more information than we would have had 15 or 20 years ago. But with that extra information, it's actually easier now to get twisted up in weird problems than it ever was before. So we really need to have a good diagnostic process. And like I said, it can be totally different. Mine's gonna definitely be different from yours. You may start by grabbing the scan tool and checking for faults, where I might start by checking the fuses. Neither one of them are necessarily wrong. They both should lead us down the right path. It's all a matter of the roads that we take to get to the end result, which is again, fixing the car right the first time and doing it as fast as possible. You know, I had an instructor named Dan years ago at the Volkswagen Academy, awesome dude. And, um, and everything was always work easy to hard. And then he would ask questions like oxygen sensors, easy to diagnose or hard to diagnose, which it could really be either one, it all depends. But I really adopted that work easy to hard mentality. I probably already had a lot of that before the training, but it being ingrained in your brain the entire time you're at training really does hit the point home. And what I mean by work easy to hard is, what are the things that I can do that are minimally evasive, that require the least amount of work, and they're gonna give me the most information about what's going on with the car? I ask this question of every technician whenever they have a problem. Did you check the fuses? And the answers vary from, yeah, I checked them and they're good. No, I didn't. I checked the one for the circuit. Or, uh, yes where I ask the question, you don't get to ask that question back, because I don't know. Basically asking me if they check the fuses, which I don't really understand. But something as simple as checking fuses should be easy, and then we work to hardware, you know, we're taking the dash apart to trace wires or chase down a bad ground. And I'll say it, because I have to say it every time I talk about checking fuses. Always, 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 one more time, always check all the fuses. Don't worry about the one for the circuit, check them all. If you gotta get a test light or a power probe out, check every one of them. Also, don't forget to make sure that they are all there and installed in their right locations. See, more than one pretty good technician get their butt kicked by a fuse that was missing. So remember, check them all. Make sure there's a fuse installed where there should be. And make sure you're checking it with the circuit on. There's no reason to check the headlight circuit with the key off. We need to make sure that whatever we're testing is going to be powered up. Also, when we're thinking about diagnosis, we have to have an understanding of the circuit. If we go in 100% blind, we're just gonna wind up chasing our tail on a problem. Now, I don't need to understand everything at like an engineering level. I do need to understand the system. So think about a light. What do we need to make a light bulb light? We need a power, we need a ground, we need a light bulb, we need wiring, and nowadays we really have modules that control all these things, so you can probably add a signal into that as well. But that signal may actually be just the ground or the power. It all really depends on the circuit. We need to know what the car wants. Does it want to turn the lights on? Does it want to dim the lights? Is it a pulse width modulated circuit where it's not sending a full 12 volts to that light all the time? Which is actually how a lot of lights are lit nowadays. And we also need to know what the car sees. And that's really gonna be like a driver input. So is the headlight switch turned on? Or has the rain light sensor told the lights to turn on? And we can monitor that a few different ways. We can look at it with a scan tool. Or if we don't have that, we have to evaluate the situation as we see it. So let's say we don't have our headlights that work. When we turn the headlight switch on, 
What happens? Do the tail lights come on? Do the parking lights come on? Do the lights on the interior come on? If the answer to all that is no, now we know we may have a problem central to the switch or the module. If all the lights come on but the headlights, now we at least know, okay, the light switch part of it is working. We know we have some kind of signal in. We know we have some kind of signal out. Now we can start breaking these circuits up into smaller sections and going after each individual component. So instead of trying to diagnose a whole big problem, we need to break it up into different sections and diagnose the ones that have the problem, not necessarily worry about the things that are functioning properly. So when we don't do things like work easy to hard and keep it simple, we can really get ourselves stuck. And getting stuck can happen really, really fast, like mind-blowingly fast. You're working and you're on the right track and all of a sudden you're 7,000 steps away from, <laughs> from being on the right path. It usually comes in a few forms. Either we've assumed something is good that we don't know, or we've assumed something is bad and we don't know. And a lot of times that's how incorrect parts get installed because we had just assumed this was the problem instead of actually doing the testing to find out for sure. We also skip basics because we get in this mindset of it can't be that because. It can't be the headlight switch because all the other lights work. It can't be the fuse because the fuse that the wiring diagram says controls that circuit is good. But, you know, and I know my fellow technicians will, will understand, wiring diagrams are not, not, not 100% accurate. I. I have been burned by wiring diagrams not being right on multiple occasions, and that, my friends, is incredibly frustrating. We can also get stuck in a scan tool loop where, let's say we check for faults and there's no faults, but we can add a test plan or we start looking at values, trying to see what the car is seeing, and we just get stuck going round and round and round and round, not really doing anything, not executing any tasks, just looking at values, which we may not fully understand what we're looking at and why. And if you don't understand what you're looking at and why you're looking at it, you are definitely going to be caught in that scan tool loop. Another thing we really have to consider when we're dealing with a scan tool is we may be having this problem because the module itself is bad. So let's say we're looking to see if, say, the body control module is turning that light on. It says it is, but it's not actually doing it because the module is what the problem is. So it's so, so easy to get just stuck. And then once you start to get stuck, if you don't immediately get out of it, your brain starts to do this tumble thing and uh, you know you just wind up making it worse and worse and worse. Then you get frustrated and that's usually about the time where someone comes up and asks you a really dumb question or you have to do some other task or you know you get pulled off the job for something else and, and sort of lose your train of thought. And this is where the only way to really solve these problems is with experience. So what happens when we get stuck? How do we, how do we get ourselves out of that stuck, out of that rut? out of that mindset of, man, this car's kicking my butt. I don't know what to do. I feel like I've done all this work. I've checked all this stuff and I'm no better off than I was three hours ago. First things first, we need to stop. I like to walk away for a few minutes. And I think if I were a smoker, I would go smoke a cigarette, but I'm not, so I don't. You know, I like to, I don't know, check my phone or check my emails or whatever. Just get my mind off that car. Even pulling another car in the shop and say doing an oil change, it can sort of take your mind off this really intense problem and put it on this really easy task where you see a start, you see a finish, the car is done and you pull it out. And then we come back and sort of refocus our brain on the car we're working on. I also like to generally get more information. If I'm stuck and can't figure out a problem, it's time to do something different. It's time to to talk to the customer and see if there's more information that they have that maybe they didn't tell you right up front. Because a lot of customers don't know, I need to tell them all this extra information. Don't let your customer tell you what you need to know. Get out of them all the information that you can, everything about the situation and the failure that you can, you need to get from the customer and then you can decide don't need, don't need, don't need, don't need, here's the gem that's gonna help me fix this car. This exact situation actually happened to me a couple of days ago and uh, it was the first car of the morning and I had a new guy start and it was the very first car that he ever seen come through the dealership. So it was a really good example that I hope that he appreciates but my guess is that it probably sort of went right over his head. I had a 2006 Beetle convertible come in with the convertible top not working. A problem that I've seen time and time and time again. My very first step was to see what it was doing. I unlatched the top, I pulled the button, nothing. Okay, now I got something to go off of. But what I also noticed is that when I unlatched the top, 
the convertible top light flashed. So now I know the closed position switch is working. I get out my power probe, I buzz down all the fuses, all the fuses are good. I relearn the pinch protection for the windows because that can actually cause the top not to work. Still nothing. Okay, so I've done like three really easy things that have taken me all of maybe five minutes. I go back to the trunk, I release the pressure on the hydraulic pump, and I roll the top back. So I know mechanically it's not sticking or stuck. Close the top, now it's time to get the scan tool. Get the scan tool, no fault stored. I go in and I check the values and I see that all the positions of the top are reading accordingly. The top showed closed when it's closed, the top showed open when it was open, the top showed in the middle <laughs> when it was in the middle, and the car scene that I was pushing the button both open and closed. Now this is the point where it's time to stop because my next step is going to be intrusive. My next step is going to be taking, say, the rear panel out of the trunk and checking for power and ground at the motor. So I stopped and went to my service advisor to ask the customer these few questions. How long has it been doing it? When's the last time the top worked? Is there any other information that I need? How often do you use the top? That way I could get a little bit more information about the entire picture because all I know is the top doesn't work but everything in the system seems to work other than actually the motor pulling the top back and putting the top forward. So she talks to the customer. Customer says, I've only owned the car for a few months. The tops worked two or three times. All of a sudden one day it didn't work. But it was weird because I was in a few weeks ago for a headlight bulb and when I left there was a fuse on the floor. Okay, that's interesting because generally there's not just fuses laying on the floorboard of your car. The fuse on the floor was the golden nugget of information. She had owned the car for a few months. Not too worried about that at this point. The top had worked two or three times. Okay, so we know she has used the top. We know the customer knows how the system functions and how to use it, and that at some point this has worked properly. So now it's time to address the fuse issue because generally fuses just aren't laying on the floorboard of the car. So I went back to the fuse panel to check and make sure that there was fuses in each location that there should be, and everything was cool there. So I went to the wiring diagram to look up any more fuses in the system. Lo and behold, there was a fuse on the relay panel for the convertible top. Climb up under the dash, take a look. Sure enough, there was a fuse missing. Go back to get the right, uh, right amperage fuse information, pop a fuse in it, top works just fine. So had I not gone to the customer and got that information, I probably still would have got there. But it wouldn't have been so fast. It wouldn't have been a 20 minute diagnosis. It would have been maybe an hour diagnosis, maybe two. Who knows? Maybe I would have got sucked into that scan tool loop and just went round and round and round looking and checking and looking and checking and not really doing anything. Now some might say this is information the customer should have told me. Maybe. Some may say the advisor should have got this information. Maybe. Ultimately it's up to the technician to get the information that they need to fix the car. And at some point you just gotta do something. You gotta try something different than you've been doing. Otherwise you're just gonna be stuck. And being stuck does not get cars fixed. Also, when you get in that stuck mode, it's a good idea to sort of bounce something off the guy working next to you. You know, hey man, have you ran into this recently? Or, you ever run into this weird thing? Or, hey, check this out, this is crazy, have you ever seen it? And that, even if they don't know the problem, sometimes you talking about it and actually saying the words can help your brain process what's going on and process a problem better. It works really well for me, and I know it works really well for the other techs in my shop, too. Also, if you have a good process and had been writing everything down throughout the entire diagnosis, you can go back and read through your notes and go, okay, check this, check this, check this. Ah, oh, crap, I never checked this one thing. Let me run and check it real quick. It'll take three minutes. And lo and behold, that may be the problem because you skipped a step. But at least since you wrote everything down, you can sort of backtrack that and find out where you skipped the step. So there you have it. Welcome inside the brain of a technician's diagnostic process. You know, it can be a little squirrely in there and, and different people do things different ways. But again, our end goal is to fix the car right the first time and do it as fast as we can. All right, guys, I'm going to wrap it up there. If you have any questions or comments, post it in the comments section below. Hey, if you like the video, throw it a thumbs up on YouTube. You can also subscribe on YouTube or on the blog at HumbleMechanic.com. You can follow me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, the blog, HumbleMechanic.com, and obviously on YouTube. All right, guys, thanks for watching, and I will see you next time. Gin and tonic out of a beer mug.